Should we cut it now? Is it already? Okay. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Welcome uh, <clears throat> to our community meeting. And uh, let me share my screen. Um, dum -dum -dum. So we have two items today on the agenda to discuss with you and share with you. Um, one of the topics is the release automation we um, want to introduce uh, this week. And so the explanation of the workflow that we uh, that we designed for the release. And the second topic will be the async API roadmap. Um, so the second topic will be covered by Fran and I will cover the first one. I think we should start with the first one because it's uh, pretty fast. So let me open the pull request. So what's basically happening this week is that um, um, for now we're starting, of course, uh, with first project. Uh, not, we're not rolling out the automated release to all the libraries that we have um, for good reason to test it first in one repo and then uh, roll out to others. <clears throat> we, with this pull request, we're going to introduce um, automated releases with the technical bots, so no longer uh, publishing to Docker uh, by me or to NPM by, by Fran, but it's going to be a um, um, async API bot that is going to do uh, publishing to NPM and Docker Hub. Um, so the most important things with this release is that, uh, with, with this pull request is that to make those releases fully automated, we are going to introduce uh, from now on conventional commits. So we can already see the commit uh, that is also used in the uh, subject of the pull request, that it's a bit unusual than the the, um, the usual commits you can see in other repos because it has a special prefix. It means that it's following a conventional commit specification where you can, in a machine readable way um, and also human readable way, because at the end, if you know the spec, you understand. Uh, those prefixes, but also for machine, for automation, it's pretty easy to um, tell the machine uh, what release should be should be taken and if release should be taken anyway. So if you, it should be major, minor, patch, or maybe the commit is not really release triggering. So that's uh, the most important thing. Um, the cool stuff. Uh, about handling it within the without within the async API will be because we introduce already squash and merge functionality on the pull requests, then we don't really have to look into the commits um, commit messages of a pull request owner. So if you made a pull request with many commits like this pull request, I've spent a lot of time on it, so it's 70 commits. Um, you don't have to care about um, proper um, uh, naming of the commits, because at the end when we merge, we squash them all in one um, in one commit, and the the title by default is set uh, from the uh, from the 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 subject of the pull request. So you just have to make sure that the so Lucas, I think uh, a good example of this kind of uh, um, problem, let's say, is uh, is actually this pull request, right? Yeah. If we go to the commit messages. <laughs> yeah, so you can see I had a lot of commit messages. Exactly. But you don't have to worry because then uh, once I click on um, squash and merge, I can actually clean that up. Um, and if I would have even the, uh, the title of the PR was would be bad, then uh, one of the maintainers of the async API uh, before merging can also adjust the commit message. So it's pretty pretty handy. Um, next thing is the uh, using this the opportunity. I was cleaning up some scripts, but I don't think it's um, uh, we should go here into details of the uh, the scripts and how the Docker publishing looks like, etc. So it's uh, you can just look into the PR later. Um, more important is that the um, the automation is done with the semantic release package from npm. Um, so the workflow works uh, in the following way, that we have a GitHub action that reacts on every commit to master branch. 
Uh, so the uh, the pull request is merged, uh, the commit is created, and then uh, the first step of the workflow is the analytics, right? We analyze the, the commit message, um, if it's uh, release triggering or not, and what kind of release it should trigger. If we uh, if the commit is not really uh, release triggering, then we um, skip the rest of the steps. Um, there's a a proper um, condition in the in the workflow that we just stop. Otherwise, we start the process. So we tag the uh, the Git repo uh, with a proper version. Uh, we um, make a release to npm and bump the version of the of the package in package JSON. We create a um, a GitHub release, and this GitHub release contains a generated change log. Uh, you have an example here in the screenshot. So it's published by the async API bot. That's how it's going to look like. And it's basically a list of all the um, commits with the reference, with the link to the pull request where you can see all the details of what changed. Uh, then we go to, uh, to Docker. And the last step of this workflow is creating a pull request uh, to master uh, in, the, in the upstream uh, with the change in the package JSON. Why? Um, it's because we should um, uh, respect the branch protection, so we should not make a direct commit to the uh, to the master branch, but uh, we have to go through the workflow like others. Uh, so we have to create a pull request with the changes in package JSON, and um, then there's a separate uh, workflow that's handling those pull requests. Uh, those pull requests. Uh, it's separate because you can imagine like now we don't have much testing, etc. But in the future, you can uh, you can imagine a pull request that has a lot of checks um, before it is ready to be merged. So it's uh, we have to secure uh, here. We cannot really do synchronous job here. We have to be um, more uh, more prepared for a long taking uh, long running a uh, checks in the pull request. So there is a separate workflow where we. Uh, first of all, um, check who's creating the pull request. If the pull request uh, is created by async API bot, then of course we automatically approve uh, the pull request. The approval is done by the GitHub action. And then uh, we have additional job that is um, not triggered until the approval is done. Uh, so there's a lot of time for, for other checks to run uh, that at the end automatically uh, this the last job is automatically merging um, and the the pull request, and because thanks also to Francesco, we've set a uh, proper setting in the repo that uh, to automatically delete merged branches. Then of course we are uh, we don't have to be afraid that there will be any um, uh, branches left after this automation because uh, they will be automatically deleted after the merging. So that's how the workflow looks like. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not a, an issue in your case, but let's say that you have uh, three commits. So you start with master, which is empty, and then we, we have three, three new commits. Only the, the one in the middle should be released. The, the problem works also with just two commits. So the first one, we don't want to release it. We just want to release the second one. With this kind of automation based on commit message, you will re release the entire master, right? The entire status that is on master. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem or not? Uh, it depends on the types of the commits. So basically the conventional commits allows you to have commits that are not triggering release. Uh, so uh, looking into the spec, um, um, feed, Prefix means that it's um, you're saying that there's a feature and uh, the major is uh, the uh, the minor is bumped. Fix is a bug fix, so it's patch release. Uh, and then if you add exclamation mark, um, then it's uh, treated as a, a major. But uh, if you have some docs change or you have a refactoring or CI configuration or whatever, then you just uh, use some different prefix like docs. Uh, so I've listed in the contribution guide for future reference a kind of cheat sheet. So we can, you basically do HOR most of the cases, or test or refactor, or whatever you, we can come up with. 
And okay. those, those will not trigger release. But let's say that you are in a, in a big refactor situation, refactoring situation and you're splitting your refactoring in, in two, three PRs. And in the middle between two of your PRs emerge a, a fix. So I will now release a patch version that also contain your refactoring. For you, it's not a problem if the refactoring is not finished, right? It will be a patch or it could be even a, a major, but it shouldn't affect anything. Um, and the, the, the way I see this is that um, <clears throat> whenever you merge to master, it's, it must be something stable, something that doesn't break. Uh, so we, we have to treat master as a stable branch always. Right? It, it cannot be momentaneous, uh, momentaneously like broken or anything, right? Um, yeah. You basically treat master as a release branch, right? Um, so that's why whatever you push into master should should always uh, should not break. Um, so even refactor, if it's partial, it should not break the library, and then it could be it can be easily released when there's another fix done right after partial refactor. Okay. Yeah. That in any case, it's a good point. Like whenever we're we're gonna work on on long uh, tasks that that might be split into many pull requests over time and even if it's not many pull requests even if it's just uh, two pull requests but uh, there's a lot of time between the first and the second the the, um, the, um, um, the chances that uh, something happens in the middle right like we have a, a commit that will trigger release in the middle it's it's higher right so whenever we Whenever we have this situation, like we want to split something in, in multiple uh, pull requests, we need to make sure that what's whatever is merged into master uh, doesn't either change uh, anything substantially, or uh, I mean, from the user point of view, uh, point of view of course, like if it's a refactor, maybe it changes a lot, but the user might not notice anything, right? Um, or if it's something like a feature instead of a refactor, and it's you only have half feature, let's say, um, we should have feature flags or something like this, right? Or even if it's hard coded in the code, like uh, this should not be, like even if it gets released, uh, this should not work yet, <laughs> right? Um, we're talking about libraries here, not, uh, not, um, an application or a software as a service, right? So I think having a, a temporary, and by temporary, I mean like one week or two or two at most, uh, if condition saying that <laughs> don't, don't do it yet, you know, like a feature flag in, in hard code in the code, um, saying this is this will not work yet, that's uh, fine, kind of fine, right? But always, <laughs> we should always look for other workflows like having a separate branch uh, which will act as a as a temporary master for this feature only which i really dislike but uh because then <laughs> if you have problems with uh fixing um conflicts merge conflicts um this the conflict starts escalating up in these branches and sub branches so and that's uh, that can be a pain, so I don't really recommend it. But yeah, whatever. Uh, if we, I think if we end up doing something like this, it's a problem organizing the tasks, not so much about the code. It's like we should split, uh, we should split work in a different way, in a way that doesn't um, make us suffer from the situations, right? Or we have a long pull request. <laughs> And that's it, but uh, which I also dislike, but in some cases it's it's the best option. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. So I think it's pretty much clear. The only um so the only open open topic is that I guess that, um, like I said, we don't roll it out to other 
library uh, libraries like uh, like the parser or the parser plugins we merge that first see how it works and then mm -hmm. then roll it out to others because they um, the, the workflows might differ uh, a bit like in case of parser we don't release docker image for example um, so I guess the generator is the most complicated here that we're handling okay so um now you from okay. i should stop sharing probably yep so i actually have this ready here um let's share my screen and before i do this let me mute notifications okay Cool. So you can see my, uh, see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So I already had this prepared. <laughs> um, so um, let's say we're announcing here now the the new roadmap for this year. Um, it's coming a little a little bit late, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, it will still work. And um, and yeah, let me just uh, proceed to invite everyone on the on the Google group to the document. Um, <clears throat> do you think, uh, Lucas? Do you think we should notify people, <laughs> or is it going to spam a lot? Uh, so far, we have only twelve people uh, registered for a single API user group. So I think you can. I mean, it's important document and new document. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure I have access. Can you add me? I think you're registered. So you okay. added yourself to this Google uh, uh, group. You might receive it now. <laughs> okay. <Watching it. laughs> so yeah, cool. So yeah, as a, as a document here says, um, the roadmap um, aims to clarify the goals of the SNKPA initiative, not just the SNKPA spec, but the whole initiative for the rest of the year. Um, we want to know, um, we wanted to know first where we want to go actually with the, with the initiative. It's like, and actually I, I've been asked this many times and I was always like, uh, I know I have to work on this. Uh, in my head it was clear, but it probably wasn't clear for everyone, right? Even in my head, I had an idea, like a big picture, but um, it was good writing it down, so. So yeah, that's uh, exactly why um, I decided to do this now. And and I decided to split this into goals and, and milestones, right? So each goal is composed by a series of milestones. And um, and just to make it clear, goals are like a big, I, I, are big as in scope, uh, uh, big goals, right? Uh, that we want to accomplish uh, for, the, for the year. And then the milestones are like, steps inside each of the goals that we um we want um we're gonna do not tasks but like group of tasks if you want um to make this goal um a reality right uh <coughs> sorry so the the goal uh the goals and milestones as it's saying here and i wanted to make it clear are not necessarily sorted by priority and we might find that we're working on multiple goals at the same time. Um, so yes, uh, let me start. So one of the things um, that we've been working on uh, for, for quite some time now is uh, tooling. So after releasing version two of the spec, it was time to work on, on something people can use actually. Uh, the spec is uh, it's beautiful. Uh, I like working on the spec, but uh, uh, without tooling, the spec is nothing, right? So, so yeah. So the first one is offers stable and extensible tooling to work with this in KPI too. Um, why am I saying stable? Is I don't know if can you see my new tab, or is it just sharing this tab? Yes, you can see it. Okay. So if I come here to parser for instance you will see a notice uh, this package is under development and it hasn't reached version one yet 
So it means that uh, it might break. Uh, so, so we might introduce breaking changes without prior notice, right? And, um, and that was on purpose. Like we need to rapidly iterate to figure out what was what's what we need. And, and if you go to um, the async API generator, uh, that's not the one. Okay, so in this one we don't have it, but if you look at the at the version number, you will see that we didn't reach version one yet. And as per semantic versioning, uh, before you reach version one, it's allowed to introduce breaking changes, right? Um, or you can expect it actually. So, but that that uh, that's something that many people were not understanding. Like uh, you're breaking, you're introducing breaking changes, and and I was saying, yeah, we're not in version one yet. We're not uh, offering stable tooling yet. Um, even though we're trying our best, but sometimes it's it's not worth. So that means that um, one of the things that we wanted to do first is. Um, make uh, the, the JavaScript parser and the generator stable, right? Uh, it is version one. And um, so that we slowly, now we will be, we will be uh, developing new features, but uh, without breaking it so much, right? Now that they're stable. We know uh, what are exactly the things that we need to do um, to make uh, the, the packages stable. Um, of course, at some point, we will come up with something new that we need to know uh, to do, and we will have to uh, release version two. But um, after some, after almost a year now developing the the tools, um, we more or less see uh, what's actually needed to to have a stable version, right? And that's what we're focusing on right now. Um, then uh, also as well, we want to focus on automating as much as possible which is related to uh, what Lucas was explaining now. We want to automate uh, everything or almost everything, right? We don't want to spend time here on uh, anyone having to deal with releases or anything. So, um, so yeah, um, that's the other thing. At the, that's a little, that's gonna be a little bit postponed, but um, we want to implement the extension catalog. So, uh, so if you have played enough with um, with this in KPI, you might have noticed that uh, there's something called uh, specification extensions, uh, the, uh, the same as an open API. Uh, and you have this X dash whatever, and you can introduce as, as many as those uh, uh, as you want. And uh, they are not validated at all. They're ignored by the parser. So you can put whatever you want there. But um, we see many people using um, similar, not the same, but similar uh, extensions for the same purpose. <clears throat> so we wanted to have like a, a catalog of, uh, of extensions, of, of uh, specification extensions that could be somehow reused and, and somehow standardized uh, by, by everyone, right? That means that if at some point, uh, for instance, we want to try something new on the spec and see how it fits. Uh, we might create an extension and we make people use the, the extension first. If it grows well and we, we play with it, we break it, we do whatever we want there, um, because it's, it's an extension. Um, once we're happy with it, we can probably incorporate it into the spec. So that's, uh, that's the idea also also the idea of the extensions, right? And uh, of course, if we're gonna have this extensions catalog, which is, um, uh, it's a catalog where you register the extension and a JSON schema definition to validate the information on the extension. Uh, so it's like a separate mini spec uh, uh, for, for this extension, right? Um, but it's not tied to the to the horse pack and it can evolve separately at a different pace and of course we want to use it we want to use the the catalog with the parser so whenever we see um one of these tensions the parser will connect to the catalog and download these definitions 
uh, and validate them. Uh, ob all, all of this like optionally, right? And you have to opt. Uh, you have to opt in, right? So you have to explicitly tell the parser, "Hey, I also want you to connect to the catalog and download the definitions and uh, of the extensions and validate them, right?" Um, we didn't have a design for. We don't have a design for for this yet, but it could even be something like, "I don't want you to validate all the extensions. I just want you to validate." specific some specific extensions like whitelist or blacklist or uh, whatever you want to, to call it right and um, and also by the end of the, this year um, something that we want to do is to make go parser stable as well and that's a little bit like uh, uh, how, how can I say it so this is this is actually bigger than it sounds because the idea behind making the Go parser stable is not for people to use the Go parser. You might use the Go parser, but the, the, the focus here is from Go, we compile to C. And, uh, and then from C, uh, or from any language, you can import these libraries in C, right? So we can, from there, we can have a Java parser that's uh, exported, let's say, from the Go one, uh, we can have a Python one. Obviously, they're not gonna be like super perfect, like the, or the perfect experience. Uh, but it's a way for us with the resources we have to to start offering something uh, to other languages other than than JavaScript, right? So, yeah. Any questions so far? Is that a is that a place where I can read uh, more about what you just mentioned? Uh, no, you will have it, but not yet. Yeah, we are actually just drafting okay. everything. Um, so this is the first step. I just just wanted to have the steps clear, and then we will we will elaborate on this. Uh, and actually, on the Go parser, that was the initial uh, idea uh, before the Java, before we created the JavaScript parser. But then we realized that uh, generating a JavaScript parser that works on the browser was going to be harder than we thought, we, uh, starting from the Go one. Um, and that's why we decided to make an exception with JavaScript because of the browser. And um, that's why we're going to maintain two, right, uh, for now. But uh, in, in the future, I, I, I'm assuming that we will have to we will need to have like um, a parser for each major language, right? And we will have to maintain all of them separately. But yeah, we need we need to start somewhere. Yeah, you know, you n you never know. Maybe Go will fix their com compiling and will be really lightweight and will be available for use in WebAssembly, and then you can use it wherever you want. Uh, yeah, no, but I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't implying that uh, it was going to. The pro is actually the browser. Maybe, for instance, uh, I know that Java has these GNI interfaces, Java native interfaces. Uh, I think it's interfaces too. Um, to work with C code, but I think it's not really ideal in terms of performance, and. Um, Performance is something that we need to take into account for the parser because uh, it may be used in SDKs that work with messaging. So performance uh, uh, cannot be, you know, we cannot have a, an async API parser that is not performant, right? So that's that's my point. So it's like it's good to have it as a starting point, and then we see how it grows. We see the interest of people on creating a Java parser or a Python parser or uh, whatever it's uh, it's the most demanded one, but um, but yeah, we need to start offering something. <laughs> right. So second one, second goal, big goal, let's say, is make it easy for people to start contributing. Um, we've been discussing this for a long time already, like, uh, and we've we've been patching things here and there, but uh, we know we're aware that uh, it's not really easy to, to start contributing. The project is already, it's already too big in terms of uh, scope, right? We have the spec, we have parsers, we have a generator, we have uh, uh, the catalog, or we don't have it yet, yet but 
um, but we will have it. Um, we have uh, documentation, we have lots of things, bindings. There are many things, bindings for each protocol, so that's a lot. And um, <clears throat> so one, one of the two things that we want to do here is clarify the role of the maintainer. Um, so in the following months, weeks of, or months, we will define, we will clarify. It's already defined, but we have to define it better. Uh, and we will, um, we will assign the role of the maintainer to someone else aside from Lucas and I. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we will have to do. And, um, and also create and maintain contributor documentation guides. Uh, documentation and guides. Um, that's something that will be amazing. Like someone, um, I want. Uh, I want to try to to put myself uh, in the shoes of someone that lands into async API for the first time and says, "Okay, how can I contribute here? Uh, where do I start from?" Right. Um, that will be creating a guide like this, like, hey, so look, in a few minutes, you will understand everything we're doing. Um, here are the repos, here are the technologies that we're using. This is how you should start, uh, start contributing. Here's where you can ask, who you should ask in case you have uh, questions, um, you know, all the all this stuff, right? Um, and I think that's that's really important for the community to grow, right? <coughs> So, um, any questions so far here on the contribution side? Um, these are just milestones, not tasks, okay? So, there will be lots of tasks inside of each of these points. Um, cool, so the other goal is make the async API specific, make the async API become the, that's incorrectly spelled. Make async API become the standard specification for event-driven APIs. Um, it's somehow already, somehow it, it already is, because there's nothing similar. Um, so yeah, but we want to make it a standard specification, not like the only one, right? It's that we want to make it like, like a official, this is a standard. And um, for this, it cannot be, um, in short, it, it cannot be mine. It cannot be a specification of friend, right? So I need to put this into a into a neutral home, right? Like like we call it, like call it uh, I don't know CNCF, Open API, Next Foundation, W three C, um, things like this. Um, so that's something that we're gonna approach in the, in the next months as well, exploring different alternatives, like like you just said, and um, and also. At the same time, I improve the definition of the governance model. Um, we already have this defined. Uh, in case you don't know, if you go to the SMKPI repo, you will see it here. It's just uh, there's a governance file. Okay, so here everything is defined, all the roles and 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 how things work, and how things will work in case um, there's a problem or, or someone like myself, for instance, that don't want to continue with the project or uh, whatever, um, which I don't think it's gonna happen soon. <laughs> but it's, it needs to be there just in case. Um, so we want to improve it and we want to make sure that we comply with uh, existing governance models, uh, open source models, right? Um, and we, we want to make sure that, um, not just that, but we want to make sure that whatever doesn't work of these uh, governance models that we know in other projects, uh, we don't want to make the same mistakes as them, right? So we should learn from them and maybe take these governance models and adapt it a little bit so we don't have the same problems, right? Um, yeah, that's like, you know, paperwork that we should be doing and all the stuff and, and then advertise so people um, know that we joined this uh, one of these neutral homes or another one that might not be listed here. 
um, second um, the second milestone is increase uh, the number of sponsors so this is already kind of happening <laughs> so I'm, I'm already having conversations with with some other uh, companies to, to become sponsored and they're all asking more or less the same thing like uh, they're asking for a document or a brochure or something um, with information about the initiative, the open source initiative, how many people are using it, how many other companies are using it. So that will be great to have something like this. Um, again, this is this is just like a, like an idea of what we can do here to increase the number of sponsors. Um, that's not a task or a, or a milestone. Um, and yeah, so so basically the the idea is is this is to to reach to reach out to more companies and and and, and try to convince uh, companies to to join the effort and and, and support this. Um, this other milestone is about increasing adoption. So we think that uh, the best way to increase adoption here is by making other people support this in KPI. So other products, like for instance, MuleSoft is, is also is working on, on that. Uh, Sola has already, I think they already launched some something in private beta and they're about to launch something on, on this month on, you know, on GA. So so yeah, there are, there's also Tipco with some uh, micro gateway functionality that support this in KPI. And Red Hat is also working on some products that will support this in KPI. So the more vendors that we have supporting this in KPI, the easier it's gonna be for people to actually um, to actually use this in KPI in their uh, products, in their environment, right? In their companies. So that's something that I also want to boost uh, in the next months. Um, this is actually like almost done, I will say, but uh, still pending. So um, release the patch, the next patch version with just patches here and there on the spec, uh, explaining things a little bit better or fixing, uh, fixing bugs on the spec and all this stuff. Um, yeah, that will be done really quickly. Um, and then after that, we will pursue the, the next release, the next uh, minor release, but um, yeah, still to it's still to be defined what's gonna end up there. I have a rough idea idea that I will share, but uh, I will share in the in the future. But uh, there are some big features that like that could be included, like for instance, um, uh, request reply support. Um, oh, so. Francesco had to, yeah. <laughs> and then also um, double down on protocol bindings. It means that we need to actually work on that pretty heavily. Um, protocol, protocol bindings are still like in, in, in draft state, if you want. And we need to actually work on that a lot and, and, and finish, finish the first version of them, right? Any questions so far? No, only question to you if you have some additional additional meeting because it's seven. Oh yeah. Well, well, it's, I, I still have time over, so I, I'll go far, uh, faster. It's the last one. Uh, so make it super easy for people to get started with async API. I think that's the the, the for me that's the the most exciting one, which is um, you know so we're gonna plan and design and then write and deploy a high quality documentation. We need to um, we need to make something really cool here and super useful. So that's uh, that's something that we will target uh, very soon. And um, another financial income could be creating paid line courses. So that's something that we're also exploring, um, and it will help us uh, financially. So that seems like a perfect fit. Um, we're already also working, but we had to cancel due to uh, coronavirus. Um, we're already organizing workshops in different cities. 
we will keep um, working on that. Um, that's something that also makes me feel really happy. It's like double down on code generators. Um, it means that right now we have like uh, HTML, uh, sorry, we have the Node.js uh, code generator and uh, Michael Davis from Solas is working on the, on the Java Spring one. Um, you know, so, and I think that, um, yeah, that Jacob, I think Jacob Branson is also working on Python and C. Um, so there, there's a lot of effort there, but I don't think it's enough, uh, enough support for different languages and, 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 uh, and frameworks. So we're gonna dedicate like milestone on working on, um, creating a lot of, uh, of code generators and of course not a lot but uh, um, working a lot of on different code generators which is different right which, uh, creating one for I don't know for Java for Python for web sockets for uh, web sockets with Node.js or um, many or and improving the ones that we have right and also adding new tools to uh, to our initiative which is like command line tool similar to Yemen um, Visual Studio Code extension IntelliJ plugin and working on GitHub actions for um, for instance I don't know for publishing documentation uh, or updating your documentation uh, in your repo uh, whatever uh, we'll have to explore this so yes any questions here No. You, you want me to ask something to make know. it like more interactive? <laughs> how how are you feeling? <laughs> you, I want you to ask me how are you feeling, friend? How are we doing? I, I'm saying good. <laughs> okay, so I hope this uh, make people as excited as, as I am for the um, the future roadmap. Uh, just uh, I wasn't. Uh, Planning to share it yet, but here is the um, how the the roadmap looks in Singhap, and which is small less still to be. So this is still not final. So um, dates might change, but this is more or less how it looks like. And yep. I'll share this in a better format because that's not <laughs> easy to, to, to consume. Can you also, uh, while you're sharing the screen, can you open this link that I just sent? So for others to know. Uh, Which one? This, uh, the, in, the, in the chat, I've sent the link to the Google okay. group. Uh, okay. So this link will be in meeting notes, but just to let you know that we uh, have this um, mailing group uh, to which we are sending out the invitation mm -hmm. to these meetings, but we also share some draft documents. Um, so we also have access to this roadmap uh, if you're joining this group. And for you, front info that uh, you probably have to change the, because now it's uh, invitation is sent to edit and you should change it to comment so people can rather comment than modify the document. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for. But yeah, it's a heads up for you guys that you can just join this group uh, freely and then get access to those docs. Cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. And also something important I forgot to mention during the my presentation about the release automation, uh, that the uh, there's an important change that's going to be introduced. Uh, that's going to be a change in the name of the of the package. So we oh, will yeah. uh, we will deprecate current async API generator package uh, because starting with this automation flow, we will introduce the packages with the annotations. So it's going to be um, a at at async API um, slash um, generator, the name of the package. But yeah, we're yeah, gonna course, API code. announce it. Yeah. 
Great. So I think there's nothing else on the agenda, right? Uh, no, there were just two, those two big items. I already sell, saved the uh, saved my changes, so the notes with links are mm -hmm. there in the issue. Cool. So we have a lot of people here today. <laughs> I guess people are not joining because of the fear of getting infected. Maybe, I don't know. So, a Mythbuster saying uh, you can't get infected over the wire. Well, depends on the wire. <laughs> <laughs> depends on what you do with the wire. <laughs> mm. it's, a, it's a good moment to stop the recording and the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Are you afraid of something? <laughs> I'm afraid of the direction of this um, the discussion, where we can end up. <laughs> okay, folks, thanks uh, for watching. <laughs>